All right, we've hit the time. Let's go. So hey, this talk is called Learning by Example. It's about stuff we've learned from the past seasons of Google Season of Docs. And hi, I'm Erin McKean, and I work on contributor experience and docs advocacy in Google's Open Source Programs Office. So my job, and it is a fun job, is in part to help open source projects have better docs. Um, if you need other credentials, I'm also an honorary fellow of the Society for Technical Communication, and I also run the online nonprofit English Language Dictionary WordNIC, and I also run the Semicolon Appreciation Society. So if you want to join, it's absolutely free. We have stickers up here, and you can appreciate the semicolon from whatever distance you feel is appropriate. So whether you'd like to keep it close to your heart or whether you'd like to keep it very far away from you, all kinds of appreciation are welcome. So anyway, that's me. What is Google Season of Docs? So, Season of Docs was originally created by two Googlers, Sarah Maddox and Andrew Chen. If you've worked with Kubernetes or a couple of other open source projects, you might have met them. Um, and uh, it was originally, in the first couple years of the program, a technical writing mentorship program, um, and it is now a grant program. You might have noticed that the name Season of Docs is very close to Summer of Code, which is a very large program also run by Google. And so the original idea was, what if Summer of Code, but Docs? But over time, the two programs have diverged in format and in intent. So here are some of the highlights of the main differences between the two programs. So uh, Summer of Code is a mentorship program. The goals of that program are to build community in open source, and to give students, and now beginners, not just students, experience in open source. And it's been going for 20 years, and it is a very big program. Season of Docs is a grant program. We give funding directly to open source projects. And the goals of Season of Docs are to create documentation, but especially to create knowledge of best practices in open source documentation. And we've been going for six years. <laughs> and uh, it's a very, very small program. Uh, now, I feel like everyone in this room knows that docs are important, but I feel like sometimes even people who believe that documentation is important are often surprised by just how important documentation is. So for example, this was in the 2019 Tidelift survey, 72% of the developers they surveyed said that documentation is a key decision factor when they're choosing open source. In the Digital Ocean survey, lack of documentation was the top reason developers gave for deciding against using an open source project. And in the state of the Octoverse from a couple years ago, developers see about a 50% productivity boost if the documentation is easy to source. So survey after survey, and there are many more that I could have included, and in fact, you should come back here at 3 o'clock to hear some um, uh, more information and statistics from the DORA program about documentation. Survey after survey shows that developers care about documentation and they make choices based on documentation. If your code is awesome but you have no docs, you're falling behind less technically adept projects that have better docs. Um, so how does season of docs work now? So first of all, have a problem. Be an open source project or organization and have a problem. This is the easiest step. Almost every project can accomplish this step. And then you should think, what documentation might help solve this problem? And then, how are you going to measure the success of the documentation that you've decided might help solve the problem? What's your hypothesis? How are you going to, how, how are, you going to figure this out? Then you actually pay, with the grant money that Google gives you, a technical writer to work on this documentation project. And then you write a case study to share what you've learned with other open source projects. That's the whole program. And so far, we've published 73 case studies since 2021. And we just announced the 11 participating organizations for this year, last week. And so what's in the case study? Basically, we wanted projects to put into the case study the information that we thought other projects would find useful when they're exploring how to create better documentation. So a project description, what did you do? A budget, how much did it cost? Um, what did you pay the technical writer and how much did you spend on t-shirts? Who were the participants? Not just the technical writer that you hired, but 
Who in your organization was responsible for helping to mentor that technical writer into, open, into your open source community? Who served as subject matter experts to help that technical writer out? What was your timeline? What were your results? What metrics did you choose? How are you measuring them? What have you found so far? A little bit of analysis. What went well? What maybe didn't go so well? Uh, a summary where you wrap up basically everything you've learned and an appendix where you can shove anything else that you might want to put there. Um, so when you look at the case studies, you can see that projects really aren't writing documentation just to write documentation, right? Doc types are not Pokemon. You're not just trying to collect them all. They're writing documentation for people. Because I think as we all know, most project problems are actually people problems, right? What problems aren't people problems? All problems are people problems. And documentation doesn't just help the people you have. Documentation helps bring people into your community and keep people into your, in your community. A user who can't use your project is not a user. A contributor who can't contribute is not a contributor. And a maintainer who can't maintain, mostly because of overwhelm, might not continue as a maintainer. So even though most of the case studies focused on the type of documentation they created, the goals of their projects were all, either explicitly or implicitly, people problems and people goals. So um, just a little bit, you know, read your documentation. <laughs> just a little bit of an aside into types of documentation. A lot of projects are using this framework right now to discuss the types of documentation they created. And uh, this concept comes from um, Daniela Pachita, who outlined these four types in a 2017 PyConf, uh, PyCon Australia talk. I highly recommend the talk, it's really great. Um, so when you think about this framework, this is roughly how the metrics mapped to these doc types that people wanted to create in their projects. They usually wanted more people, more users, more contributors, and they wanted less noise, fewer questions, fewer issues. So, tutorials. More people giving your project a try, more visits. More people learning about core use cases of your project and trying them out. How-to guides, more visits. Fewer questions, because the how-to guide explains what they had questions about. Explanations. They wanted more PRs because they wanted more people qualified to contribute to their project by understanding the goals of the project, understanding what the project was for, and they wanted fewer questions. Reference. You know, more, more parts of your project made intelligible to more people, so they wanted more coverage, especially of things like APIs, and they wanted fewer questions. So you can see a common thread across all of these doc types is fewer questions, right? Everything from, is this right for my use case to what is this API signature? Because questions are stress on a project. So, and lots of projects just wanted more people. Get them in at the top of the funnel, right? After the new document was released, daily visits to the CASBIT and CASDOR almost doubled and bounce rates dropped. More people, more people staying. 95% increase in the number of users viewing the open API CL docs from Redoc. Sometimes you need to bring in more kinds of people to your project to be successful. So for OpenMS, they were able to make the historically underprivileged individuals who were coming on board as new contributors more successful because they had a new manual. Documentation helps users build the skills they need to use the project successfully. So here you've got the why and how of their software from Moja Global. And uh, prior to this documentation existing, only those with technical abilities could use this tool, which helps make um, textbooks. So Calibri had a great project working on uh, strings for translation, and they got immediate feedback from their translator community. This is a screenshot from their case study where they're like, yay, now we've got people who are able to help contribute translations because they did this string analysis project. And of course, giving people better alignment with the processes and the ethos behind a project. So P P5.js created steward guidelines. What does it mean to be a good maintainer of P5.js? So not just technical instructions on how to work with reviewing issues and PRs, but how do they aim to manage their community as a whole? And this kind of information 
is often passed just person to person, if you have documentation, then it means people who aren't already in your network, who may not be able to have a personal conversation with you, can come on board and help grow a project. More contributing people, right? Project is without a doubt successful. Having an inclusive guide to send to contributors is a huge win for Julia. And then the uh, Wasmedge project grew their contributor count as well. Now, better docs make users feel like their needs are seen and cared for, and that makes them more likely to be engaged with the project. Um, so PyMC found that the whole community found that they were mobilized and energized, and that spilled over from the documentation project that they were working on into people feeling enthused to work on governance because they felt like the project had some like energy getting put into it. And better docs here, um, <laughs> Sigstore improved their whole website. It's not really fun to go to a project website and have uh, there be caching bugs, search being frozen. And so the contributors here felt like they were being cared for, their needs were being heard, and the documentation helped improve that. Um, they grew their technical writing community, many of these projects. Either they hired technical writers who decided to keep participating after the paid part of the program was over, or the new docs energized new docs contributors because they saw that people were working on it and they were like, oh, hey, I could probably do that too. Um, but docs can't help if people can't find them. So Mojo Global set up a documentation working group and they wanted to make an accessible entry point. And a lot of projects over the whole history of Season of Docs have mentioned improving the organization of their docs in some way, either explicitly or just kind of finding as why they went through their project, organization improved. Um, better, more findable docs means fewer confused people, less stress on maintainers and communities. It helps users help themselves. Um, so we found that Mautic found that their questions dropped by 20%. And uh, Apia had a really impressive stat here that 95% of their questions in their um, public chat room were able to be answered with a direct link to a wiki. That is very satisfying in my opinion. I always enjoy like being able to just send somebody a link. Um, nicely, of course, I add like a smiley emoji. Um, <laughs> so. But for many projects, it was the first time that they'd had new contributors to their communities specifically for docs. So this caused new community problems, right? It wasn't all like, hey, everything's great, we have docs, because all solutions cause new problems. So maintainers said that they got a lot of value from working with technical writers, but many open source project maintainers do not have experience with recruiting, hiring, and paying technical writers or reviewing documentation. And communications coordination was a problem, um, especially in 2021, many writers had to drop out of the program because they got sick, right? COVID was a big issue. Um, so <laughs> uh, these were some of the things that project maintainers said that I thought was particularly interesting, right? Turns out they hadn't obviously heard Manny's talk earlier. There were no tests to provide extra reassurance about their docs. They actually had to look at them. And the rest of the community felt like, oh, now we have these good docs. We're going to have to work to be up to that standard. And uh, a lot of uh, project maintainers found that, oh, wow, technical writing is harder than I thought it would be, which, you know, it is. <laughs> uh, so when you're thinking about perhaps applying to Google Season of Docs or maybe just starting a documentation project in your own project, so remember to allow for the necessary community and process changes when, you, when you're thinking about adding, changing, or updating your documentation. So do you have enough people? Is this gonna be another burden on some overstressed maintainers? Do these people have enough experience to work with technical writers? And if not, how can you get that experience? Can you create documentation that is gonna bring new people, energize current people, or help people improve their skills? And can people easily find, use, and contribute to the documentation that you're creating. Because obviously Season of Docs intends for these case studies to be used by other open source projects as guides for how they can solve their own problems through documentation.
But it's important to understand how to use the case study so you don't end up hitting your thumb because you picked the wrong hammer. You know, don't just pick some other project's solution and cargo cult it into your project without understanding if you really do have the same problems, the same community, the same needs. So I think first you should have a really good idea of where your project actually is. Where are the pain points? If you do not know where you are, you don't know how to get anywhere. If you can't answer these questions, you're not ready to think about what kinds of docs you need. So I really want to spend some time on this, you are not your user issue. So sometimes I like to call this the, the framework problem. So it turns out if you are the kind of person that writes your own framework, tooling, you know, platform, you are not the kind of person who uses other people's frameworks, tooling, or platforms. So the answer to the how do I do this question for you is write a new framework, write a new tool, create a new platform. That is not the answer that most people come up with. Otherwise, our ratio of frameworks to developers would be one to one. I think it's now just 0.89 or something. But like, yeah, so think about who is the person who is not as excited about the tool as they are about the end result, right? There are far, far more people in the world who like to eat cake than who like to write recipes to make cakes. So you're thinking about the cake eaters, not the recipe writers. And then really, what do they want to do? They want to eat cake, right? What is blocking them from doing it? They don't have a good recipe. How can you make your recipe the most delicious one for them? And then you can go back here. Now, this is not the only way, again, to think about documentation, but it's a great way to start. Maybe you've written a tool that helps newbies do something, which is great. But it turns out that you can do all of the horrible developer environment setup in your sleep, and they cannot. Have you thought about making a more comprehensive installation or getting started guide that's slightly more comprehensive than pip install, right? Lots of troubleshooting for environment setup always helps people who are new. Maybe your project is a tool that makes it easier to do things that used to be like the domain of PhDs. And now you can no longer assume that everybody who's using this understands the basics of radio frequencies or linear algebra. And so now your project is getting a lot of 101 level questions, right? You might need some 101 level documentation, maybe more explanations, maybe more reference. Here's how to do this particular kind of math that everybody who built this tool can do in their sleep, woken up at 3 a.m., right? So once you have a better idea of who your user really is and what they're trying to do, it's easier to read through the case studies and to understand how other projects implemented their own documentation solutions, what problems they ran into, and how they measured their project's impact. The measurement part is key. A really important thing about metrics, we ask projects to tell us how they're gonna measure the success of their project. But when you choose your metrics, I think you need to ask yourself this question. If you choose a metric, and no matter what that metric is, you're not gonna do anything different, that is not a metric. That is a Christmas tree ornament. That is decoration, right? If you're not gonna do anything different, why are you measuring it? So if you just go, oh, that's nice, or oh, too bad, Pick something else that will make you change your behavior based on that number. If you chose increased PRs as your metric and instead your PRs went to zero, what would you do? Do you have a plan for what happens when you have that metric? What if it went to 1,000 PRs? Are you, are you prepared for that? I think a lot of times people think when they're metrics, they think about the worst case scenario and they don't think about the horrible best case scenario, right? We think about the good best case scenario. What if we went to 100 PRs? That would be amazing. What if somebody decided to use a generative AI tool and just crashed your project with 10,000 PRs? Are you prepared for that? Is that really a best case scenario? Uh, I don't know. So when you're really thinking about your metrics, think about what would make you change your behavior and only use those metrics. So uh, we often see people talking about metrics that um, are easy to measure, but perhaps don't indicate <laughs> an actual difference in their project. This is called like the, the street lamp effect. Raise your hand if you're familiar with the street lamp effect. 
You have to raise your hand because I told you about it the other night. Um, <laughs> you know, there's a, the joke about uh, a guy walking by and he sees another guy who's basically on his hands and knees looking for something. He's like, oh, can I help you? What's happened? He's like, oh, I lost my keys. And, you know, the first person is a good Samaritan. And he's like, yeah, I'll help you find your keys. And they look for a long time. And finally he looks at the, the, the person he's helping. And he said, where did you lose your keys anyway? And the guy goes, over there. And he's like, well, why are you looking over here? He's like, well, this is where the light is, right? Don't just look for metrics that are easy to measure. Think about what's actually indicative of the behaviors, the user behaviors you want to see. So um, you can find all of the project case studies, except for one where they let their link die, and now we're ensuring that all the case studies are backed up to the Wayback Machine um, on the site, plus other helpful information. I also encourage you, uh, if you haven't already, to join the welcoming community at Write the Docs and start making connections with technical writers. How many people in this room are primarily technical writers? That's what you call yourself. All right. How many people here are engineers who, or software developers who have a deep and abiding love for technical writing? Awesome. All right. How many people stumbled in here by accident and you've been wondering how to get out? Um, <laughs> thank you, Elena. Um, yeah. So if you are a project maintainer who has the bandwidth to mentor technical writers who are interested in open source, who have technical writing experience, but maybe not open source experience. The Write the Docs Slack, free to join, has an open source channel where you can hang out. Um, we do see projects putting in um, you know, requests for help in that project from time to time. But I just want to reiterate that the important part is having the bandwidth to mentor the technical writer. Because the incentives for participation in open source are different for technical writers than they are for software developers. If you raised your hand when you said you were a developer, have you gotten a job based on participating in open source? Maybe? Lots of people see open source contributions, rightly or wrongly, as a resume builder. Um, if you said that you were a developer, do you actually kind of code sometimes just because it's fun? Yeah, uh-huh. When technical writers write for fun, they often write, say, fiction or poetry or plays. Um, <laughs> they might not necessarily write how-tos just for fun. Uh, so the incentives in terms of both like the financial paycheck and the psychic paycheck for participating in open source can be different for technical writers. Now, some people, like me, have a terminal case of over-explainy disease. And so, you know, that's actually a nice way to participate in technical writing. You do feel good explaining things to other people. But if you're trying to recruit technical writers into your open source project, make sure that you have the bandwidth to mentor them to participating in open source, using the tools, and also that um, you show, I think, appreciation because the uh, the rewards for contribution for technical writers are often very different than the rewards for software developers, right? You don't get to see that lovely, uh, you know, green contribution box on GitHub if you're writing in a doc that somebody else is going to put into Markdown, right? So think about what's actually motivating them and make sure that you can make that happen. T-shirts are usually great. Stickers. I have plenty of stickers here to help motivate all of y'all. Um, I wanted to leave plenty of time for questions, and I also wanted to end a little early because I'm the last person between you and lunch. So <laughs> I'm happy to answer any and all questions about semicolons, technical writing, season of docs, whatever you would like. Yes? I have one question about the change from mentorship to, I guess, uh, you have targeting the docs as a mentorship uh, in that process, but then when it changed, I was like, oh, this is different. There were a couple different reasons. One, we found that with Summer of Code, you have the maintainers of the projects who are mentoring students, and they're both developers or software engineers, usually. We found that when we were bringing students without much experience or new to technical writing into software projects, the maintainers often didn't know very much about technical writing and found it hard to mentor the students. That wasn't true in all cases, but it was enough that we were like, hey, is this really working? Also, 
season of docs is a, a very, very small program compared to Summer of Code. And honestly, on the Google end, the tooling wasn't there to support the hundreds of technical writing applicants that we were getting. We're getting a lot of um, PII that we wanted to handle, you know, names and email addresses. And we thought, okay, well, we have choices about how we spend our budgets. We could spend the bulk of our budget to make a brand new tool so that we could have a really nice application, website, and like have everything great. Or we could spend the money actually giving it to projects to make docs. <laughs> and so we chose, you know, door number two. I have been trying to talk to people about how we can get that mentorship like feeling back, either as part of the current season of docs program or just trying to figure out how we can encourage mentorship for technical writing generally outside of the program. But those are the two main issues. One, we found that we thought it was a mentorship program, but the mentors didn't have the experience to mentor in that domain. And we were like, oh, we only could accept a very small number of orgs compared to Summer of Code, but we're getting so much interest from people with no technical writing experience that we would have to build a whole new tool just to support it. So those are the two main reasons. Yes, let's go back to the questions one. So let's take a, a how-to example, right? So let's say you're getting a lot of questions about how to do a certain thing, and you decide to write a tutorial, a how-to guide that says, here's how to do it. And your step one is fork this example repo and walk through the steps. Instead of the questions, you can say, how many times was this forked? And maybe. Uh, that can be your signal for are people actually using this. I would say that there's kind of like a Pareto rule of question answering, that some percentage of people are just always going to ask you first as a human because that's what they're comfortable with. Like they prioritize that as an interaction modality, where there's also some percentage of people who um, would rather gnaw off their own arm than like bother somebody in a chat to ask a question. So. Uh, even if you do get lots of questions, you might actually never see the people who just bounce off because, oh my god, I have to talk to a human being, even through the medium of a screen. So think about what kind of proxies can you do for usage. Like, I believe I'm contractually obligated to mention Google Analytics at this point, but there's so many other analytics things that you can use. I don't work with that team, but you know they're lovely people. But still, you can do some analytics. How many people come to your docs? How many people bounce right away? Um, and then also, if you have the bandwidth and you crave that in-person interaction, having community events is a nice way to hear from people who not only don't want to look at the docs and don't want to send you a question, but also uh, <laughs> might, if they were in a comfortable room with other humans, might start giving you feedback. Oh, no problem. Yes. That is a really good question, because I do feel like <laughs> there was this brief shining moment where everything was on the web and findable, and now we've kind of gone back to where things are essentially radio and <laughs> not necessarily searchable or findable in an easy way, especially if you're on a free Slack instance where it's like, ah. Oh. 
oh, two weeks ago, now you're lost to the dimness of time, right? Um, I think that it would be great to try to encourage people to kind of go more into like a scribe mentality. Like if you see a really good interaction in chat, be like, hey, who wants to screenshot this and put it somewhere findable? Who wants to transcribe this from this chat modality to something that's more findable, that is less evanescent? Um, but again, everybody's busy. Everybody is like doing too many things all at once. It might be a good way to get people very new to documentation to be like, oh, hey, we have a role for someone who hangs out in the chat. And when they see a question asked and answered, they just add it to this list over here. And you know, maybe that's something that can make people feel useful and be useful. Did everybody hear that? I just want to say that that was a good, a good first issue, good first commit type project to go and say, oh, hey, the answer's over here, turn it into docs. But I would say that, as you pointed out, it can be a high barrier to entry, right? Because you've got to know, well, what is the doc style for this project? And how do I actually fork this repo so that I can make a contribution? And then I have to open the PR and I have to sign the CLA. So before you start doing this, you might want to have documentation that shows how to do the thing. It's like, it's just documentation all the way down, people. I'm so sorry. This starts <laughs> from the beginning, goes to the end. Yeah, have people seen the Google Developer Style Guide? Yeah. Um, unsurprisingly, you can Google Google Developer Style Guide, and then you will find it. Yeah. Um, the people who work on it are just lovely, and they even have, um, this is not confidential, there's an internal rotation program at Google so that technical writers from across the company can volunteer to work on the style guide. Um, uh, for a while, which means you get a lot of good perspectives. I did it for a rotation. It was great, even though the meetings were like at oh dark thirty um, in the morning to accommodate, you know, world wide time zones. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes I feel that people who don't feel comfortable writing, that discomfort is, I don't know, context dependent. So they feel comfortable communicating, but then once it has writing with a capital W on it, they're like, oh no, I'm not a writer with a capital W. So some of the tricks that I like to tell people is just be like, okay, you're not writing technical documentation. You are writing an email to somebody you're trying to onboard onto this project and write, dear Bill, dear Jane, and then just write it like you would write an email and then hand it over to the tech writer. Because even the people who are the least excited about writing can certainly write an email. And if they feel like even that is too much, text to speech, pretend you're giving a whiteboard talk, pretend you're giving a chalk talk, and then have it dump out into a file hand it over to somebody who really likes to lovingly hand insert semicolons, right? Um, it's the, it's when it's framed as, oh, it's real writing and lots of people are gonna read it and they're gonna know that I don't know how to know how to use a semicolon, then people get really anxious about it. 
But if it felt conversational, sometimes that works. And if they really don't want to do that, <laughs> bulleted list. Because usually they're fairly good logical thinkers. So they're happy to make a bulleted list of this first, oh, subset these, this second. And if you tell them, oh, it doesn't have to be prose, it can just be bullets, then that can help too. Anything else other than that, then they might need more professional help. Yeah. In a nutshell, when is it okay to use a semicolon? <laughs> <laughs> there are lots of good examples in the Google Developer Style Guide. Um, mostly they say kind of don't, though. So, um, <laughs> so uh, it's when you are separating two ideas in a single sentence that could be standalone sentences, but they kind of want to cuddle next to each other. So if you could put a period there, and then it would feel like maybe they had like a little fight, and now the sentences aren't as close as they used to be, then that's a place where you could also put a semicolon. Also, you can use them in JavaScript. I don't know if you know this. Um, but <laughs> All right, so we're almost at time. Any, any, oh yeah, hi. <laughs> um, hi, uh, I'm a sophomore engineer at Google. Um, I have a very two small general uh, question. Um, I want to know um, why the name is called, why the program called Google Sees on Drive? What, what, what do they see? <laughs> oh, thank you so much. That is a fantastic question. Sarah Maddox, who is the person who came up with the program, lives in Australia. So, during the time period that this program runs, it is not her summer. So she was always kind of mad that like summer of code didn't really like apply to our Antipodean friends. And so she was like, no, it's seasoned. It is season of docs. <laughs> so yes, thank you for letting me say that because I always forget. That is why it is season and not summer of docs. I think reading through the case studies would help anybody who's interested in documentation, right? Because docs don't exist just to exist, right? Docs are there to do something. They're not poems, right? They, they're like implementive. So reading through the case studies and saying, oh, they wanted this to happen. This is the documentation they created to try to make this happen. And this is how well it worked. Um, I also think that there are some good technical writing classes that, um, that Google has that are actually public that, that you can take, and they're linked from the Google Developer Style Guide. Thanks. Thanks. Oh, you're welcome. All right, so I have, to, oh, one last question. Yes. Uh, collection and all the AI. So the wonderful thing about the history of technology is we just have the same anxiety over and over again with every technological advance, right? People thought that the telegraph and the telephone would make people be hermits because they would no longer have to get together to talk. People thought spell check was going to lead to rampant illiteracy among school children. I'm not even joking, right? And so there's this period of anxiety and stress at the beginning of every new technology where like, you know, the sky is falling, cats and dogs are living together, it's the end of the world as we know it, and it is, it is the end of the world as we know it, but we don't actually know often what the actual effects of these technologies will be. Like, I mean, I don't know about all y'all, but I am of the age where I was absolutely promised a flying car, right, and a jet pack, and like food and vitamin pills, and none of that has happened, and do you know why? Because we have these technologies, but they are not cost effective. Do you know how much it costs to train these models? It is bonkers. 
like the environmental cost, the cost in GPUs, do we actually have, is it actually more cost effective to have an AI smooth out my sentences and remove all the semicolons that I lovingly hand inserted? Or are we going to save those technologies for where it is cost effective? So I don't know. I do think it is useful, especially for people who do not feel like they are especially fluent in English, to have these linters like Veil, vale, to have spell check, to have an AI go and smooth out their you know, phrasal verbs. I think that's fine. I think that's great. But remember, a lot of these technologies are just um, statistics as a service. And so what the, the text that they create may not actually be accurate. So are then you paying people to go and review things? Then you've still got people in the loop. So there are many parts of the things I do every day that I wish like an AI would do for me, um, like wash dishes. Um, <laughs> and there are many things where I do allow computers to do the work for me because they're better at it, like basically all basic math. Um, so yeah, I would say I'm not really worried about the death of technical writing because a lot of the things that we see when new technologies are implemented is that they upskill, right? So I feel like a lot of documentarians feel like maybe they don't have enough time to work on higher level information architecture tasks because they're always writing how-tos. If you could generate a how-to and could spend that time making sure the information architecture is great so things are really findable and logical and consistent, I think a lot of people would be like, great, sign me up. And even if that means I have to double check that step three isn't blow up the moon, right? Then that's fine. Does that answer your question? That was kind of a rant. I tend to go a little ranty when AI is involved. <laughs> All right, I think it is time for lunch. So.